Well, happy Independence Day, church, in a couple of days, and uh, I'm excited about it. I love being a patriotic American, and today uh, we are not necessarily going to have a full sermon about how everybody uh, needs to just jump out of their chairs and <coughs> rush over and throw rotten tomatoes at the White House or anything like that, but uh, we, uh, I, I would like to talk to you a little bit about the fact that God has given us this world. God has given us this world. And of course, you don't want to forget the Beatitudes from the Sermon on the Mount that tell us that the meek shall inherit the earth and uh, that Jesus told us in John that in the world we will have troubles, but fear not, I have overcome the world. And so there might be troubles in the world, there might be riots in France, there might be things going on here in America that have you very disappointed, upset, and uh, very concerned about the future. Last week, we talked about Jeremiah chapter 29, and how a lot of times our church, our body of believers, is a lot like the children of Israel in exile, with some differences. Uh, God had sent them into exile in order to purify them because they had brought it on themselves with their sin. Now, when I was a kid and dad told us a bunch of Bible stories and I had a lot of Bible knowledge in my head, I didn't understand that the exile was the, capital T, exile, capital E. Because I knew from the stories in the book of Judges that um, the people would fall away from God. They would worship false idols. God would allow invaders to come in and harass them and and God would raise up a deliverer whenever they turned and they prayed and they asked God to deliver them from the invaders. And this happened over and over again. The next generation would go right back to worshiping false gods and God would allow the invaders to come in and trouble them. And they would turn back to God and everything. And so I thought, oh, those are all exiles. The people were in exile all the time. Absolutely not. The children of Israel, in fact, it was the southern kingdom of Judah because uh, whenever the northern kingdom went into exile, they just blew apart, man. We don't know where those lost tribes are today. Some of them came back and they became Samaritans, but many of them were just scattered. They lost their cultural distinctiveness, and all we were left with was the southern kingdom of Judah. And God promised them for years, yes, you're going to go into exile. Yes, everything that you hold dear to your culture is going to be destroyed, but I'm going to keep you as a people in exile. And I'm going to bring you back and you're going to rebuild the temple and you're going to reconstitute the nation of Israel here. It was never quite like they remembered it. But we are not necessarily in exile, although last Sunday we looked at a lot of the advice that God gave the children of Israel. Don't, don't, be, don't be a sleeper cell. Don't be seeking to overthrow the Babylonian government so you can come back home and be very, very Jewish. Seek the welfare of the city that you are in. Seek to uh, uh, plant gardens, build houses, invest in real estate, build a life there, uh, arrange your marriages to your sons and daughters. If you're single, find a wife, find a husband, go ahead and continue to live your lives in exile because you're going to be there a while. And so last week we talked about how that was advice for us because, yes, I know that uh, many, we've been talking about end times on Sunday night, and we've been trying to learn that there are many different views, and the one that is most popular, the dispensational premillennialism, man, Jesus is coming this afternoon, tomorrow morning at the latest. And so we must do things now, but don't worry. The world is going to hell in a handbasket anyways, and that's exactly what the Bible said it was going to be. Some of us pastors don't like that idea because even people who don't go to church will start talking with them about how bad things are getting in the world and they'll say something like, you know, but the Bible says that the world's just going to get worse and worse anyways, right? <sighs> with that attitude it is, come on people, a guy came back from the dead. We are no longer afraid of death. My goodness, when did we become so defeatist. So sometimes there are defeatist churches and they don't want to rock the boat too much and they'll point to Jeremiah chapter 29. We should seek the good of the city that we are stuck in for a while. 
And yes, last week I preached on how that is good advice in some way. We should do what is going to be economically good for our nation and our city. Our grandchildren may have to live in it someday. The Lord may tarry. Well, I know, most of you already have grandchildren living in it. But pretend that, you know, we had some younger folks here. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, your great, great, great grandchildren may have to live in it, so invest in it. But this Sunday is going to be different. This Sunday, we're not in exile. The church is victorious. And we're going to start off in Joshua chapter 1, verses 1 through 9. So go ahead and open your Bibles. Joshua chapter 1, verses 1 through 9. Uh, in, 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 uh, and, and of course, these are, these are, this is all good advice from the Bible last week and this week. We don't want to be defeatist. This is not the end. Uh, God may not have predicted that they would win over the Babylonian Empire, but God has commanded us to take over this world with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And he has given us the power to do that. Much like when the children of Israel, as an assembly, as a congregation, as one people, were gathered at the border to the promised land, and God told them, I'm going to empower you to go in and take the land. Joshua chapter 1, verses 1 through 9. After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, son of Nun, Moses' assistant, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now, therefore, arise, go over this Jordan, you and all this people, into the land that I am giving to them, to the people of Israel. Every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I have given to you, just as I promised Moses. From the wilderness and this Lebanon, as far as the great river, to the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites, to the great sea, Toward the going down of the sun shall be your territory. No man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. Just as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not leave you or forsake you. Be strong and courageous, for you shall cause this people to inherit the land that I swore to their fathers to give them. Only be strong and courageous, being careful to do according to all the law that Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right hand or to the left that you may have good success wherever you go. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be frightened, and do not be dismayed. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you that you go before us, that you care about us, O oh Lord, and we thank you for the kingdom that we get to build here on earth. We thank you, O oh Lord, because it is so superior to all of the other ways and problems and, and lifestyles that are present here in this sinful world. And I pray, O oh Lord, that not only as we look upon others trapped in the bondage of sin, not only would we see that, but, Lord, I pray that you would give us your eyes to see ourselves and our own lives and the sin that so easily entangles us. I pray, O oh Lord, that we would first examine ourselves and lean into your grace in such a way that we would be set free from the sin that entangles us, from the lifestyles, from the nations that we call ourselves citizens of, so that we no longer have to bear that sin, that we would be citizens of your kingdom, O oh Lord. Teach us what it means to have dual citizenship so that we can affect America and Missouri and Johnson County for good, but that we would represent your kingdom there as well and bring it on the earth in a way that honors, magnifies, and glorifies you. In Jesus' name, amen. This week, now, uh, when I originally wrote this sermon, this was not an Independence Day sermon. You know me. I ignore holidays unless it's Christmas and Easter. And, uh, but as, as, uh, <clears throat> as I t turned on television to me TV yesterday morning, nice and early, couldn't help but notice all the Looney Tunes were patriotic. And I thought, what's going on? Oh, yeah, it's the weekend before the 4th, of course. And then I definitely couldn't have missed it on the way home from bowling last night. <laughs> So, uh, my mind has definitely been in this state. Uh, you're going to hear a lot of preachers talking about how this is a Christian nation and it was founded on Christian principles. And we are losing that. The more liberal, the more uh, 
the more we find our ways into all of the trends that are happening today. And, uh, and some of you might be wondering why I've always been a little bit shy of preaching it exactly that way. Well, because I'm a nitpicker. That's why, okay? I had an epiphany this weekend that I really don't want to be seen as the pastor who says, no, let's not treat America like a Christian nation. Let's not pray. Let's not, let's not vote our conscience. Let's not search the word of God and see uh, which political uh, party or uh, uh, issue or whatever, seek God on it. No, I believe we should do all of those things. We should vote our conscience. Uh, we should take a stand against the things that God calls abominable. Uh, but was America founded as a Christian nation? I want you to hear me loud and clear. The answer is only technically no. Okay. In its heart and soul, yes. The colonies were started, so mostly, most of them were started, so that the people who didn't get along with the established state church in England, we call them Episcopals here, but it was the Anglican Church or the Church of England, uh, the, they were so popular in England that we were troublemakers. And the King of England was happy to wave goodbye to us on the ship as we came over here, and we were happy to wave goodbye to him as we came over here too, and established colonies where we could go ahead and be Puritans, Congregationalists. In fact, one of those marginalized communities, since that term is so popular now, was a bunch of Catholics who founded Maryland. I was shocked to learn that. But they didn't get it. They didn't understand that having a state church is part of the problem. So if you lived in a Congregationalist colony and you decided you didn't want to be Congregationalist, guess what? You were just as persecuted as your ancestors were in England. And so some people escaped Massachusetts and started their own colony of Rhode Island, and those people were Baptists. And it was one of the few colonies that did not have a state religion in the charter because Baptists believed that we should be allowed to freely proclaim the message of Jesus, but we shouldn't force people to be a part of any church. So someday I'll preach on the separation of church and state and why it is a good thing and it's a very Baptist thing, even though it gets used in very bad ways today. Uh, but anyways, imagine, put your, but, but is America a Christian nation? Why would I say it is not technically, but it is in its heart and soul? Put, your, put yourself in the mindset of the pilgrims who set foot on Plymouth Rock in 1620 and they were in a new world where the seeds they brought from England didn't grow. Most, many of them had died off on the trip there. One of the first buildings they built was a hospital. And they were religious people. They were not like the settlers of Jamestown who had landed there. All men wanting to make money off of growing some kind of crop here and shipping it back to England. It was, Jamestown was primarily a uh, financial venture. But the pilgrims were religious people, and they were escaping religious persecution. They had first fled to Holland and felt like they could not retain their distinctiveness in Holland, and so they made off for the New World. And they landed here, and they were starving, and nothing was working out, and they had never encountered a New England winter before. And it was bad. And then, and then, if you don't know the story, you know, I like to watch Star Trek. And it's funny that they can go to all these planets way out there in space. And what do those aliens already speak? English. <laughs> now, I know they, they, they invented the universal translator and everything. And so, you know, there's, there's a technological reason they can go to any planet and speak English. But, but picture yourself on the shores of this alien world in New England. Someone had already cleared the land. But there were no natives where they landed to have to fight with and war with. And then after that first hard, hard winter and your colony is dying. I mean, it's just a matter of time before starvation comes for all of you. Out of the woods walks an Indian who speaks English. Can you imagine how these very religious pilgrims, these people, Congregationalists, who were on a mission from God to establish a colony where they could worship God, 
the way that they felt in their own conscience was the way God wanted to be worshipped based on how they had read it in the Bible and not subject to what the King of England told them they had to do. And it had been hard, sure. They, they had not felt blessed in their endeavor up to that point. But then an Indian walks out of the woods, speaks English, shows them how to raise corn and how to fish, and saves their colony, and they make peaceable treaties with surrounding tribes. Holy cow. How could you not see this? And so many of those religious groups there, they, they saw it all as like a mandate of God. God brought us here to build these colonies. They didn't do everything right. They had conflict with the natives. They did, uh, they, the, you know, there was, there was mistakes made along the way. Thank God when they decided to combine the colonies into the United States of America, they couldn't all agree on what the state church should be. And they discovered that, well, at least one colony got by with having no state church. And so technically... America is not a Christian nation. It's not in any of the legal documents. England is a Christian. It's the great, the United Kingdom of Northern Britain and great, uh, great Britain and Northern Ireland is a Christian nation. It is in their legal paperwork, but it is not in ours. You're free to be whatever you want. But in our heart and soul, America was founded by Christians. There was a lot of uh, what you call. Um, escaping me now enlightenment philosophy that went into it too but still it was only because that was compatible with christianity that god made man in his own image and that man should not really be owned by another man or owned by a king and told what to do that man can stand before god that very protestant idea that had been around since the protestant reformation at least and had always been in the bible that we forged a new nation here now, of course, they saw their expansion, everything is an expansion of the kingdom of God. That idea has, uh, uh, you know, because it came at the cost of the lives of some of the Native Americans and stuff like that, that's fallen out of favor. But I want you to know today, God wants us to take over this world. God wants us not just to take over America. He wants us to take over this world. And I'm not ashamed to say that. And we're not necessarily called to do that with guns and things, although, of course, uh, when you have established an area where everybody's happy worshiping God and someone wants to come in with guns and undo that, that's where we get into all the questions of, well, can't I pick up my gun and defend what we have here? And I would say, yes, absolutely. That's, that's where the logic comes from. But God told Joshua and the children of Israel to go in and take the land and I will be with you as you do it. And I will drive them out before you. And the church, and here's, here's one of the reasons I do like to say that America is not technically Israel or a nation of God or anything like that. Because if you think America is Israel and, and a, a godly nation, and we're supposed to, then you might think that America is supposed to carry out the mandate of God. And you might miss that God does have a nation on this earth, holy, chosen people, and he has commissioned them with bringing out the kingdom of God. And that is the church. And I think it's very important that we identify ourselves. We can be very proud to be Americans. We have a million reasons to, to be very proud to be Americans. We're only 4% of the world's population produces like 60 or 80% of the economy of the world. You know, it's, it's ridiculous. But if you want to be a part of a nation that is supposed to be so powerful, and its idea is so wonderful that it's going to spread all over the world, and take over. The Bible says that is the church. That is the church. And America will only be a Christian nation as long as we embrace Christian principles. Amen? And so we can do that in America. We can do that in Cambodia. We can do that anywhere in the world. And it might amaze you how much God is moving in those other parts of the world. And we are missing out. And I don't think we should just lay back and say, ah, well, God's moving there. He has his reasons for not moving here. No, I think... I think we can pray, and I think we can preach the gospel. I think we can do all the things the Bible commanded us to do. We don't have to lay down and take it. We may have to work harder than previous generations. Previous generations had the first great awakening to work with. They had the second great awakening to work with. People got caught up in the Jesus revolution of the late 60s. Man, it just seemed like all we had to do was open the doors, and people would just pile into the church. So what if we have to work a little harder these days? God has told us we can go in and take the land. Number one on your sheet, 
I love this phrase. We actually debated it in college uh, because sometimes the, uh, sometimes the health, wealth, and prosperity preachers use it a little too much, but it's still true, so I included it this morning. Number one, God loves you and has a plan for your life. And I forgot to add the word wonderful in there. God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. It may not feel wonderful at times as we are persecuted and as people call us haters and as we proclaim that uh, uh, homosexual lifestyles, trans lifestyles, all of those things, they're not biblical. It is sin. And that our country doesn't need to be condoning them. As we proclaim the truth, people will tell us we're just being hateful, we're just being backwards and stuff, but we know it to be the truth. We find it in the Bible, the God who made human beings knows how human life is supposed to go. We don't need to get tied up in all of this uh, sexual terribleness. We need to put sex in its proper place. And, and we need to understand that God created marriage and that marriage is even more important than sex. And sex has its proper place inside of marriage. And what is marriage between one man and one woman? And we all have things about us that God made us this way or we assume God made us this way. You know, did God make me bald? I went bald. Was that part of the plan all along? Well, doesn't matter. I've come to terms with it. It'll be okay. Someday I'll be fully healed. I don't know if that means I won't have to shave in heaven and I'll be perfectly bald or, or if I'll just have long flowing hair like Samson. Me and Samson can share salon tips and dad. He had long hair too. God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. Number one, his plan for the children of Israel was that they would slay the giants and take the land. They would not do this alone. There would be supernatural intervention. Number one, again, God loves you and has a plan for your life. His plan for the children of Israel was that they would slay the giants and take the land. They would not do this alone. There would be supernatural intervention. And I know that uh, we don't often talk about giants in the Bible. And it occurred to me that if I'm going to believe in Goliath, which I love, and we love that story, I better believe in the other giants in the Bible too. And part of the story of the children of Israel conquering the promised land as God directed them to was that they were afraid of the giants at first. So they wandered in the wilderness for 40 years and Joshua led the people who were willing to face the giants. But even then, they didn't fully conquer the land. They were still scared of some of the tribes that lived there. And it wasn't until we finally get to David, hundreds of years after Joshua, that someone is finally willing to face down a giant because has the Lord on his side. What are we afraid of? What have we given up hope on? If the Lord really was on our side, then we wouldn't have to worry about X, Y, or Z. That didn't matter to David. Didn't matter to Joshua. Shouldn't matter to us. Let's move on to our next scripture, Matthew 28, 18 through 20. This should be a familiar passage, but maybe it isn't. Uh, I've been meeting with someone who's been helping me be a better pastor, and I said, what, is, what do you think the church's vision ought to be? I'm Southern Baptist, man, Matthew 28, 18 to 20. The Great Commission, go into all the world, baptizing them, teaching them, make disciples. That's, that's the theme for everything. And he said, does your church know that? And I thought, well, they should. Then I realized, how often do I mention it? So, of course, we want you to know more about the Bible than just what I tell you on Sunday mornings, okay? That is key. That is going to be key. I don't see how anybody thinks they can work their way through the whole Bible just listening to one sermon once a week on Sunday mornings. But at the same time, if it is my job to lead you, then we need to talk about the, one of the most important scriptures in all of the Bible. And so, once again, we're going to talk about it this morning. And someday, when you rise up with one voice and tell me that you are sick of reading the Great Commission, I will finally feel like I have done my job, okay? Matthew 28, 18 through 20 reads, And Jesus came and said to them, 
All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Number two on your sheet, similarly, similarly to God telling Joshua to go into the land there, similarly, Jesus says he has all authority. All authority. Sometimes when people quote the Great Commission, they start in verse 19. And I feel like that's a mistake. Yes, that covers everything that Jesus commanded us. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. But I feel like it leaves out a very important phrase. We can do what Jesus has commanded us to do because Jesus has won all power and or authority. So if you want to write power in that blank, also, or if you want to, if you don't feel like writing out authority, you can write power instead. Jesus came after he had died, after he had rose from the dead, after he had spent 40 days. And these, uh, we get the impression in Matthew that these are his parting words to his disciples as he is about to ascend back into heaven. All authority has been given to me on heaven and in earth. The Son came. Though he has been eternally present with God, not only was God the Father there at creation speaking the world into existence, but the Bible tells us that Jesus is the Word, capital W, Word, and through him all things were made, and without him nothing that was made was made. And so Jesus was also present at creation. There are a few pseudo-Christian groups that get this wrong. They think that Jesus was born and actually began his actual life being born in Bethlehem, that perhaps he was some kind of hybrid or a child of God, and that he has achieved Godhood, and he has worked his way through the spiritual ranks, and someday he will be seated at the right hand of God with all powers and authorities under his feet and everything. And the Bible uses a lot of that language. But the, if you really get to looking at the Bible, and this is what Christians have always taught, Jesus did not have to become born in Bethlehem. He was perfectly fine sitting on his throne in heaven from eternity with God the Father. But he came to earth and he lived our meager existence on this earth. He was hungry. He cried. He had to have his diaper changed. He was fully dependent on his parents. In fact, so much so that whenever he decided to stay behind in Jerusalem without telling his parents, they freaked out like they would about any other child. Jesus lived a human life, a fully human life. He didn't just show up one day to be crucified in a skin suit. He had hometown friends and family. He had a history with people. And he had a ministry on the earth. Sometimes as Southern Baptists, we make such a big deal about how Jesus died for your sins that we're kind of left wondering, so why did Jesus take three years of ministry to accomplish all of this? He made disciples. He taught them what they needed to know. And we are called to do the same thing. And we can do that because Jesus' sacrificial death on the cross, he was already God and had all authority, and yet he won authority in, that, in some way, making that sacrifice. Probably the authority and dominion that we lost in Eden. I've been given all authority. Go, therefore, and preach, proclaiming. Verse 19, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all I've commanded you. And behold, I'm with you always to the end of the age. So starting number two over again, similarly, Jesus says he has all power or authority and he commands us to A, make disciples. Make disciples. Jesus had people following him, learning from him. And they had the Old Testament. They had the books of Moses. They had the prophets. They had David's Psalms and Solomon's Proverbs. And they had all of that, but they saw it the wrong way. And now they had the creator of the universe who had originally inspired all of those things explaining, no, 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 it's more like this. We took 
God's law and used it to prop ourselves up and to find loopholes so that we wouldn't have to follow parts of it we didn't like. And Jesus showed up and he said, no, you don't understand. This was supposed to make you more generous. This was supposed to make you think of other people more than you think about yourself. It was supposed to do all of these things and you've ruined it. You've messed it up. So Jesus spent three years setting that aright in people's minds and died a sacrificial death on the cross to pay for the sin of mankind because the blood of bulls and goats could never do it. B, baptize them. Baptize them. We are not big on what baptism does here in the Baptist church. And, I, and we're still not going to be. This sermon isn't going to change that. But it's still important. Jesus still said to do it. And I believe that not only do we want to know that you pray to prayer, you ask Jesus into your heart, and that God came in and changed you from the inside out. But when Jesus says we want you to represent that to the world with a water baptism, we want to be obedient to that command. That's why, that's why it's in the formula. I tell them in obedience to the command of our Lord Jesus Christ, I baptize you now. And in many cultures... To actually go, maybe you're toying with this idea of Jesus and God and worshiping the man Jesus as God, but you're not really committed to it until you go through a ritual. And so in many parts of the world, that, they get the significance of that ritual. I was baptized. But for us Westerners, I want you to know Jesus makes the change. The water in the baptistry doesn't make the change. But it's still very important that we follow through and we do this. And Jesus commanded it, make disciples, baptize them, and C, teach them. The letter C is teach them. Teach them all the things that I have commanded you. And so these are Jesus' parting words. We don't just proclaim that Jesus died for their sins and ask everybody that wants to go to heaven, get dunked. We teach them. We make them into disciples. We, we do our best. Now, of course, the Spirit of God does this. And Jesus has been given all authority, and he empowers us to go forth and do this. So it's not the work that we must do, but it is our calling that we must live out. We're going to look at Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. Oh, once I got into this, there were so many verses we could have gone to about running the race and finishing well. And even though God does all the work, even though we are expecting the Holy Spirit to convict hearts, and so that they would turn to God and Jesus saves them and his sacrificial death on the cross saves him. And we need to not get so prideful about our contribution to it. Oh, man. Because I preached a certain way, this many people came to Jesus. Oh, because we had a certain program. We need to not be prideful like that. But I feel that we need to be obedient and do the work. And we need to not be timid about going out into the world. And bringing the kingdom of God to the rest of the world. Sure, we've had some setbacks. Evil has encroached upon us quite a bit. If you come on Sunday nights and we've talked about <clears throat> different uh, end times theories of interpreting the Bible. There was, in fact, just about all the Puritans here in America were what we call post-millennialists. And they believed that as the missionary effort grew in the world, they were just going to keep winning people to Jesus and winning people to Jesus and winning people to Jesus until suddenly Jesus comes down from heaven and establishes his millennial kingdom. And most people are okay with that because they already love and follow Jesus. We call that post-millennialism. And then the 20th century happened. There were a couple of world wars. Communism showed up and entire nations declared that they were atheist. Nations that had been nominally Christian like Russia declared that they were now an atheist state. In fact, I was shocked to learn that the I wasn't shocked to learn that the number one biggest religion in the world is Christianity. When you add together all the Catholics and Protestants, it's it's over two billion people. It's really quite amazing. Next in line is Islam, and we all know how crazy fast Islam has been spreading throughout the last few centuries. And they, as they conquer a nation, then that nation, that's the short version of the story. It's a lot more complicated than that. 
But I was shocked to learn that in the third place is people who actually call themselves atheists. And then I thought, well, I guess that's probably, the, if, if the government does the reporting, that's everyone in China. And it's a lot of the former Soviet Union, because, man, you go and you witness to those people over there, man, their education system still says only weak-minded people believe in God. That's just silly. And, of course, we have a large atheist contingent here in the United States. But to think of it as a world religion in third place, that just blew my mind. The world is getting darker, and so post-millennialism went by the side. The missionary effort isn't working. It's still a good thing to do, but it's not working, and we're, we're losing ground here, and we're losing ground there. And I want to tell you, man, we should work at this so hard that we just look back someday and see those as just setbacks. They were setbacks, but God came through for us. That's what I want to see, and I want to see churches praying. I want to see churches proclaiming the good news, and if we need to have a big uh, evangel evangelistic thing under a tent or with motorcycles involved or if we need to go back to having week-long revival services or whatever it takes as long as we're praying and we're proclaiming the good news and we're doing our best to make disciples that's what we ought to be doing in hebrews 12 verses 1 and 2 the writer of hebrews i think it was paul sometimes sometimes i don't but Nobody really knows. It's not, it's, it's not signed by anybody. It doesn't say I, Paul, at the beginning or anything like that. It's anonymous, technically. Chapter 12, verse 1. He's just been through the Hall of Faith, talking about Abraham and Moses and even Samson, who was not <laughs> incredibly faithful, but he was one of, God, one of the people God used. Praise God, people still, God still uses people, uh, even when we're not that faithful. 12.1, therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Number three on your sheet, like a runner, like a runner who runs a race, like a runner, and they, of course, had the Olympics back then, and this was uh, what Paul and others would uh, refer to because they, they knew that people would understand. Like a runner, we can train with weights, but we cannot run our race with them. We had cross country and we had track. We started it, actually, when I was in high school. That's how podunk our little town was. And uh, I was not a runner. I was a shot put thrower, so I used weights all the time. But they had ankle weights for the runners and stuff, and, and you, you did not wear those during the race. And as our church wants to go out, we need to get rid of the sin that so easily entangles us. Sure, maybe it made us stronger at one point, but we need to. it is time to clear away the obstacles, whatever obstacles we can clear away ourselves. Of course, our race might involve hurdles, right? And you have to jump over them because that's part of the race. But, but we're not going to make, let's do our best to keep them as short as we can. Number three, like a runner, we can train with weights, but we cannot run our race with them. The weights are sin. Of course, they could be other things too. We're too busy to do the work of God. We're too, um, and, and, uh, you know, we, uh, mental illness is so prevalent these days. I recommend you take your meds, meds and do the work of God. Amen. I mean, just so many people I run into, the, the problem starts when they quit doing what the doctor told them to do. Now, I might have issues with the fact that so many people have been medicated. There's kind of part of my brain going, wait a minute, what's going on here? But at the same time, by golly, just do what your doctor told you to do. That'll help in the short term, at least. And we can also talk about these deeper things. But just follow those instructions. This will require sacrifice. That last sentence there on number three. This will require sacrifice like Jesus. So we read in there that Jesus, for the joy who was set before him, he endured the cross and he won his victory. And now we have a task that God has put before us. And so we're going to sacrifice and we're going to win the victory. And without the sacrifice... There is no victory. Of course, Jesus made the ultimate sacrifice. It's still all of him doing the work. But in our lives, what are we called to do? We're called to sacrifice and attain the victory in Jesus. 
and will lead to our glory. That last blank on your sheet is glory. Like Jesus. Jesus, the, with joy, for the, who for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. And so, as we are in this Independence Day weekend, and we are thrilled about the many victories, we like to recount World War II, and we like to maybe not talk about some of the other parts of history, you know, but those times we were victorious, we celebrate, and, and we, we thrive on that with our, our patriotic pride. Jesus endured the struggle, won the victory, and God has a victory for each one of us, at least one. It takes struggle, and it takes sacrifice, but Jesus is our model for that. And so I call you, sometimes it seems like, you know, as we're working with things under the hood here at church, or you want to know why is painting the hallway going to do any good? Well, it's going to do some good, okay? And it needs to be done. Uh, let's sacrifice and let's work together. And then after the easy things are done, like changing the bylaws and painting some of the hallways and maybe getting some new carpet in places and figuring out what to do with all the sound issues in the fellowship hall, just in case we ever do grow, we've got to have church in the fellowship hall. Holy cow, I don't know what to do about it. We're going to come to the hard battles. We're might going to have to talk about some heart issues, some things that have been standing in the way of this church for a long time. There might have to be some attitudes that change. And you're going to wish that we still had a room to paint instead of do that. Who knows? I don't know what's in your heart. God does. I don't know. <clears throat> I don't know what victory you need to have over things in your life. I don't know what weights and snares are dragging you down so you can't run the race that God has called you to do and finish well. I don't have. A, I, some of you I know and some of you I don't. And I'm not God. I can't see y'all. But I pray that the Lord help us, show us what those are. And I know I'm always praying for God to just magically remove obstacles. And God has been really on me lately. Travis, you're there to lead your church, to remove the obstacles with my help, to show everybody what it needs. And so I'm, I'm changing my prayer life. Show us what we need to do, God. Work in so-and-so's heart. And maybe I'm a little bit less like a four-year-old that just wants dad to fix everything. But it's not going to be easy. The easy thing would be to close this place down and go to some other church that seems to already have it going on. This church wants to stay open. This church wants to be a witness here in this community. And I think that's noble. I think it's perfectly in line with what God wants us to do. I'm just trying to warn you, it might be hard. It might be difficult. It might be more difficult than you ever thought. But I think we can do it. I know we can as we turn our lives entirely over to Jesus. God is perfectly happy to give small groups of people great big victories in him because he's been given all authority. Won't you pray with me? Father, we lift up this congregation to you. On a holiday weekend, we're missing... A lot of folks, a lot of empty seats, it can get very discouraging. But Lord, we thank you for the strong showing we had last Sunday. And Lord, I just pray that you'd bless us with the knowledge that we are a family that is growing, even if not everybody is able to show up on the same Sunday. Lord, we have obstacles in the way. And as we learn that we can remove some of them, Lord, make us brave enough to do that. Call us to build your kingdom in the way that only you can. Lord, guide and direct me. Teach me what it is to be a leader, to guide and direct these fine people in order to follow you more. And Lord, bring us, as you have already been done, doing, bring us new people that they might learn about you and have their lives changed by you and help build the community here that you want to see and that represents you well. In Jesus' name. Amen.